Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy, the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. And today we're going to be briefly discussing the microbiome. Uh, I've got some questions here that have been asked uh, that uh, our viewers wanted me to try to answer. So um, <clears throat> the first question would be, how can we repair the microbiome with our diet? Well, before I actually get into that question, I want to explain what the microbiome is. The microbiome is the bacteria and other things that live in your gut that help you digest food. And not just digest food so you can get the nutrients out of them, but your microbiome uh, can actually produce neurotransmitters in and of themselves, which is kind of freaky because bacteria don't have brains. So what do they need neurotransmitters for? They use those neurotransmitters to manipulate the host to provide the sustenance that they need, sometimes at the expense of the host and sometimes at the benefit of the host. So what we really have here is a second brain operating in our gut that some of the, some of the cravings that we have, some of the <clears throat> even sadnesses or the um, um, emotions that we experience may not even really be our true emotions. They may be things that are happening in that second brain. So um, now, as weird as that is, um, it, in its, it's in its own way fascinating because there is a way to tinker with this. Uh, we have seen people who have uh, started their journey in having mental health symptomatology by taking antibiotics. They said, well, you know, I took antibiotics and all of a sudden I'm anxious and I'm panicking and there is a there is a possibility that if you if you are changing the microbiome to that degree, that there could be mental health symptoms that go along with it. And conversely, we have seen not as frequently, but we have seen people who have taken antibiotics and had a, a alleviation of their mental health symptoms. So um, now, how do we do this without you know poisoning ourselves uh, or poisoning our microbiome? Would be um, the topic of what we're going to talk about. So. Um, how can we repair the microbiome with our diet? Largely in the evolution of molds and you know other fungal species that that uh, they learn to subsist off of starches, carbohydrates, and sugars. So if we skew our diet more towards fats, especially, uh, I guess you know in their evolution they didn't really see a whole lot of fats and learn to metabolize those as nutrition sources for themselves. Fats do provide us with the ability to make energy in the Krebs cycle, but they don't work so well for the other um, more invasive sort of um, pathogens that may be living on our gut. So shifting over to a keto diet or shifting over to a diet that has uh, less starches, like a Mediterranean diet where you're eating um, vegetables and meat uh, or vegetables and a different protein source if you're a non-meat eater would be um, sort of the baseline of how to develop your microbiome. And then fermented foods, um, <clears throat> that old sauerkraut that your grandmother or uh, hopefully someone in your, uh, in your family tree there used is actually medicine. They didn't necessarily do it just for the taste. They did it because it does help you break down food. So fermented cabbages, kimchi, just adding a little bit of that with your meal, um, even if you don't like it at first because it is a little bit new, uh, can be beneficial to, your, to your, the, the, you being able to break down these foods and get the nutrients out of them in the first place. Um, <clears throat> next question is, why is gut health vital to your mental health? Well, uh, a lot of these, you know, what we eat doesn't just break down on its own and form the neurochemistry. There's a process for that. So the process of actually chewing our food, getting the enzyme releases from our salivary glands, the enzymes that are located in your gut, the proteases, the lipases, and other things, that's part of the way that we break down and make bioavailable or even um, configure the nutrients in the first place. So those folates and B12s and the things that we're pulling out of these uh, out of these um, out of these um, uh, foods, and some of that's happening with the enzymatic um, processes in our body and the in the glandulars that produce those enzymes. But the bacteria are really what's breaking that down, kind of like. Uh, Kind of like earthworms break down the soil in order for plants to be able to use that soil. Um, it's kind of the same way. You know, the, the, the bacteria in our gut are breaking this stuff down and um, basically um, 
their poop is our sustenance. So we definitely want to um, attune ourselves to having a microbiome that serves us, and, which is different than having a pathological type of uh, bacteria that could actually poison us, and not just our physical body, but our mental processes as well. <clears throat> um, what is all the fuss about gluten? Well, there's a lot of fuss about certain things, and um, in the short video, we can only touch on the certain things, but by and large, not just gluten, but any, any source of grain that has not... Our grain sources, uh, rice included, um, non-wheat, uh, uh, you know, like buckwheats and things, by and large, even those have been um, poisoned to a certain degree. Those strains have been poisoned to a certain degree where they cannot ward off the funguses and the other pathogens in their in their world. So then they become sort of plague ridden, and then they impart that sort of thing to us. But by and large, when you're talking about grains and you're talking about gluten, in many ways you're looking at something that just doesn't digest real well in the human body. Um, we only have one stomach as opposed to um, four stomachs, and that leaves us at a certain disadvantage to being able to digest certain things. And um, Gluten, for many, can just act like kind of a wadi ball of gunk in our um, in our system. But then it also feeds, you know, um, more aggressive uh, 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 mold colonies and things like that that use it as a food source to bloom and to basically pr create a mycotoxic poisoning, uh, potentially mycotoxic uh, uh, poisoning in our system. So. And other things, just, just any any grain that's not sprouted. I mean, even rice, you know, you can sprout wild rice, but most of the other rice varieties, you can't actually sprout them. If something hasn't sprouted, corn even, it's not technically bioavailable. So it's not even technically quite living. When those grains and when the corn and when those other lentils and stuff are sprouted, then they avail themselves to being um, bioavailable to us in order for us to get the nutrients out of them. Otherwise, they actually have defense mechanisms to, because you know, grains and, 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 and seeds have to live in the ground for a certain amount of time and prevent any sort of um, breakdown from the soils and other um, micro, uh, microbes that live in the soil. So they have anti-enzymes that keep that from happening. And then until they've sprouted, they're not actually available for us. They, they impart that... Um, that anti-enzymatic effect, which is one of the reasons why we get gas when we um, eat beans that haven't been sprouted. It's because of the, uh, the, 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 we're not able to actually break that down. It's not ready yet. <clears throat> okay, um, why is protein helpful for mental health? Um, well, the amino acid precursors that are the breakdown products of protein are actually what it takes to synthesize neurochemistry. That is certainly part of it. Um, your protein sources do not have to be meat-based in order to gain that benefit, and there are a lot of non-animal um, products that provide enough protein sources for us to be able to subsist on. But if we're a low protein content and we're living off of carbohydrates, not only does it affect that microbiome, but it, it, can, it can starve our brain from the building blocks that it needs in order to be able to construe uh, neurotransmitters. Okay, next question. Uh, how undiagnosed food allergies can contribute to anxiety, depression, and psychosis? Oh, the, the, there's a lot of work still for us to understand these sort of mechanisms, but when you have an inflammatory response, it's not just happening in your gut, it's happening in your entire body, including your brainstem. So when you have um, basically a <laughs> compression happening around your um, the base of your brain, um, where your brainstem is, it can um, contribute to a lot of, you know, uh, flow that should be happening in your in your cerebrospinal fluid and within your nervous system to suddenly kind of come to a bit of a grinding halt. So we do see people with food allergies having, you know, sort of a toxic inflammatory syndrome that contributes to it. But also some people uh, <clears throat> have more dramatic reactions to things. And <clears throat> if... If you're having inflammation, it's kind of like if you have a if you have a a, a membrane for osmosis, it's semi-permeable, and you have more pressure on this side, <clears throat> excuse me, 
then what's happening on this side? Well, then obviously the osmotic gradient is going in this direction. So if you have inflammation that's pushing so hard on the outside, in the inter, the outside of the cellular space, the intercellular space, you're not getting good flow across the cell membrane. So the in intracellular space, as opposed to the intracellular space, is not actually able to move uh, nutrients or waste products back across the cell membrane. So that sort of toxic metabolic buildup can contribute to um, not feeling well, feeling depressed, having lack of energy, spoiling your energy metabolism, um, you know, a, a lot of metabolic things that can create anxiety, depression, and, and even schizophrenia. Um, a lot of, one of the interesting things, and I just um, really did some deeper research on this because it just was like this yummy, like finding a gold mine. But um, this one systematic review of, uh, uh, that, was, that researchers did um, in their publication, they reviewed 16 different research studies that compared the microbiome of uh, severely mentally impaired people uh, against people who were normal non-psychiatric controls. And in all 16 of those articles that the, that the, that the researchers uh, had reviewed, all of them showed that there was differences in the quantity and the diversity of the microbiome uh, to the detriment of, of, of the people that had SMI as, composed to the, as compared to the people that uh, were not mentally health afflicted. That's quite astounding because realistically, science is not quite pinned down, oh, this is the schizophrenic gene, or this is the part of your brain that's damaging schizophrenia. Some of these mental health symptoms, like I said, are not actually even coming from in here. They're coming from here and the relationship with what we have up here. So uh, hopefully this brings you to a greater passion about discovering um, some of the fascinating research that's happening on the microbiome and taking some of that informa information and implementing it into your life. Thank you and have a great day.